Hey, everybody. Good afternoon. We're back. And today I'm with Dr. Sharon Coiner, and I'm really, really excited about our topic of mood, memory, and cognition. And um, we're going to dive deep into some new um, genetic testing and some stuff that's really changed not only my life, but the lives of my patients. Um, you know, I know a lot of you out there are listening are either practitioners that are dealing with uh, complex, difficult cases or your patients. They're in the midst of a health struggle. And if it's not you, it's probably someone you love. Um, and what I found in my experience over the years is I remember, you know, 15 years ago, uh, doing functional medicine and having someone with thyroiditis come in or menopausal symptoms or maybe fatigue or headaches. And it always seemed like, um, you know, getting to the root cause was fairly straightforward. We'd fix the gut, we treat the hormones and within three to six months, the patients would be feeling great. And what I've seen now is the complexity of the illness and the types of patients that are seeing me at least. And I think this is real common to my colleagues. If you're listening, or if you're a patient, you're nodding your head too, is so much greater. And I would say it is rare if ever that I have a case where there's one problem or one solution or that it's simple. Um, and I think uh, if I talk about the background there, I think some of it is our environmental toxic load is continually increasing. Our stress levels are increasing. Our electromagnetic radi radiation is increasing. So there's a lot of strains and stresses on our immune system and on our body. And it's almost like the straw that broke the camel's back. And we're reaching this equilibrium here where we, we're reaching you know, um, the speed at which our immune system can't keep up anymore. And it, it's sad. Um, and of course, you know, as I bring uh, people to interview and we talk about topics, what I always want to bring is just great information to help you, whether it's what are histamines, what are EMFs, how to deal with this stuff, because the more information you have, the more empowered you are to either uh, as a clinician, help your patients or as a patient, ask questions that get to the root cause. So that's, that's just a little background here. Um, I want to introduce, um, Dr. Cohen today, and um, just so excited to have her here. I know you're going to love the information she has. If you want to uh, find us, you can find me on the website, jillcarnahan.com. You can also find this video and all of my 60 plus other videos on my YouTube channel. If you just go to um, Jill Carnahan on YouTube search, and you'll find all the videos there and you can rewatch these. And this one, of course, will be replayed as well. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Sharon, and then we will jump right in. So she's a chief medical officer and co-founder of Intellix DNA and Resilient Health Austin. And we're going to be talking about some of this genetic testing that uh, she's developed. I'm so excited for that. Uh, she received both her master's and medical degree from Harvard Medical School. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Family Medicine and a diplomat of the American Board of Integrative Medicine. Dr. Hausman Cohen has been in the field of integrative medicine for over 25 years. She and her co-founder developed Intellix DNA as an answer to an unmet need in the in integrative and functional medicine community. The need for accurate evidence-based genomics tool geared to helping functional and integrative physicians. Uh, practice personalized medicine. And again, as you heard in my intro, this is why I'm so excited because I'll tell you in a few minutes, some of the changes it's helped in my own health and in some of the health of, in the health of some of my most complex patients. Um, they envisioned and created a tool that could help identify root causes of cognitive decline, environmental acquired illness, and other chronic illnesses, and one that could also help clinicians know how to address these genomic factors. That's another thing, again, you're going to see this, but what I love about her tool and her testing that she's to help to develop is that there's really practical interventions. So many of these things, my patients bring in this 200 page report and they're like, I don't know what to do with this. And the doctor doesn't know either. So the great thing about this is I feel like we've got lots of practical tips and tools of how to actually use the data because data isn't the problem. We have thousands of pages and ways to get data. It's uh, how do we use that data? Um, she loves to combine uh, her passion for science and medicine and using her scientific mind to integrate large amounts of complex data. I love this, <laughs> Dr. Sharon, same, same as me. She's taught extensively around the country at conferences for physicians as well as for community members and will be featured in a documentary being released this year in the future of healthcare. As she's published many, many papers and worked along co-authors such as Dr. Dale Bredesen on the landmark paper, Reversal of Cognitive Decline. So thank you so much, Sharon, for being here. I am absolutely delighted. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. So I would love to hear first is how did you, we talked just a little bit about your background in that, but there's always a little bit of a personal journey. How did you get into creating this company and uh, tell us a little bit about your journey to get here? Well, as I said, I left academia. I thought I was going to do a PhD in medicine, but it didn't really take me very long to figure out that I was not a one 
one pathway type of girl. I didn't want to spend my whole life on one pathway of the brain or one hormone. So I did a complete switch, went to medical school and became a family physician because I was interested in so many different things and said, I'd always get back to research when I found the right project. I had had a strong background in genetics before I, I had gone to medical school. And then the 23andMe revolution happened and patients started bringing me their genomics and going, can you help me prevent cognitive decline? Can you help me prevent heart disease? What, can, what does this all mean? And I realized there was not a tool that was developed for clinicians, especially those of us in functional and integrative medicine that was accurate or useful at being able to take that genomic information and translate it into what is the root cause or what are the many root causes of what's going on for the patient and how can I help them? So uh, at that time I had just left a bigger practice and founded uh, Resilient Health with my co-founder, Carol Billich. And she came up with the idea of saying, let's reach out um, and see if we can get a custom report developed for our needs as a functional medicine office. Uh, that ended up evolving to us just creating Intellix DNA and uh, offering it then to clinicians across the country. Because obviously when we realized it would take tens of thousands of hours and yeah. lots and lots of research staff and money and all those things to develop that it needed to be something more than just for our office. And so now we're really proud that it's being used by clinicians like you across the country, like Dr. Bredesen and his studies. And we've had so much success with helping people, whether it be with environmentally acquired illness or cognitive decline, or just trying to understand their osteoporosis or heart disease or diabetes and improve it without all the solutions being medication. Yeah, and I'll just tell you a little bit my personal experience as a clinician and even my own testing, because I've done this myself. Um, you know, Sharon, it was so interesting because I've had these patients where you do everything that should work and they're just stuck and they're not getting well. And a lot of the patients I deal with have mold related environmental toxicity. They have Lyme disease and co-infection. So lots and lots of toxicity issues and infectious burden, and they're just stuck. And I remember the very first one we tested, um, she had uh, waking edema, um, really, really difficulty with the, any sort of antibiotic or herbal regimens for the Lyme and tick-borne infections and, um, and was really gaining weight like excessively and had no, you know, ability to lose that weight. Well, she had, because of some pancreatitis related to one of the infections had gone on a very low fat, high carb diet. And it was still complex carbs. It wasn't like she was eating junk food, um, but that worked better at the time for her pancreas, but she gained all this weight. And I remember you might know the name of the gene. I just know the functions because I remember what we did to intervene, but there was a, a specific gene around carbohydrate metabolism and sugar intolerance. I call it, it's not a technical term, but you guys listening will know what I mean. And literally we are like, you have to go off all the carbs, especially anything remotely sugar related or refined. She lost 40 pounds in a month or two. I mean, it was very, very quick weight loss. Uh, I don't know if you remember that at all, or even the gene. I think she had problems with her adiponectin pathway. And so when she was eating the wrong foods, she just couldn't metabolize starch as well at all because of her genomics. So yeah. And the inflammation too, right. Wasn't there a real pathway around those that particularly for her was very, very inflammatory, which it is for all of us, but like for her, it was like on fire. Right. Uh, I don't remember the other details, but what I do remember is we talked about the genetic interventions. You and I actually went over that test because it was my first one. And then I put into place a lot of the steps that we talked about. And within three months, we really saw a turnaround. So that was when I became a believer. <laughs> and again, I loved what your work was, but this is a, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of information. And so for me to implement it, it took that case. And now I have three or four cases and every one of them has been game changing, like really, truly game changing. Another patient um, was almost bed bound with muscle weakness and he had an inability for his muscles to use carnitine for it to get into the muscles. That, remember that? And then also- the that case I remember really well, yeah. yes. Right. <laughs> and then also um, inability to convert T4 to T3. Now we saw what's so strange is he had all the symptoms of hypothyroid. He had uh, you know, clinical evidence of a low-ish T4, normal TSH. And when we gave him T4, he just crashed. He did terrible. So no wonder, right? And so he's someone we just made some interventions on and haven't seen the change yet, but I expect we're gonna also see a turnaround there. So totally game-changing. I have one more that I'm going to review soon. So we'll report back on that. And then myself, oh gosh. So I had breast cancer at 25, Crohn's at 26, grew up on a farm with lots of toxic chemicals. And one of the most fascinating things to me 
So it's, I had to write it down because I don't know the names of the genes. NQO1, and I, it was only 7%, so a really rare gene. And again, you can clarify this for me, but it was uh, re related to like solvent and benzene inability to process. Do you want to say a little bit more about the gene and then I'll tell how it affected me? And I think that's a really good point, Jill. We as physicians, we can't memorize hundreds of genes. I mean, there are 25,000 different genes in the genome and it would just take up useless parts of the brain to memorize it. And that's exactly why we built the tool because even the most experienced, most proficient functional medicine doctors, mm -hmm. that's not what they want to spend their time on. And so what we did is built this tool that explains the gene and the gene function, but that gene, that NQ01, which is an NADPH quinone mm -hmm. reductase is basically recycler of your antioxidants. So there is a famous NQ01 SNP that is what um, one of the dirty genes. Well, that one's pretty common. That one's in 30% of the population, mm -hmm. but this one is even more serious. It's only in 7% of the population and NQ01 is needed to keep CoQ10 in its active form, to recycle vitamin E to its active form. And we know that those antioxidants are so important for getting rid of toxins and toxicants, which can contribute to the risk of a lot of different things, including cancer. Wow, so, it made so much sense to me. And, and later, I recently interviewed my grandmother, my only living grandmother, um, as I'm writing my book to get history. And one of the most fascinating things I learned about her history, and then I wrote an article about benzene toxicity based on this, and I didn't even know that I had this genetic. But what I found out was uh, she and her siblings lived over, a, their, their uh, father moved into town and bought a car dealership when she was about 14 or 15, and they moved over the auto dealership, but right their house, their apartment was right over a auto shop with diesel fuels. And back in the day, they didn't ventilate well, and those fuels and the fumes and the solvents from the benzene and probably lead um, came right up into the apartment. And my grandmother's mother, so my great grandmother would get so sick with migraines. And she was back in the day when now we have all these people, I'm gluten sensitive, I'm dairy sensitive, I can't eat peanuts, I'm sensitive. I, if I go in the uh, aisles of the grocery store, I get sensitive. This multiple chemical sensitivity is a sign of toxic overload and it's super common, right? Like now we see it all the time. Back in the 1940s or whenever that 30s even, that was not common. And my great grandmother had that, like she would drink the wrong water and like react. And so I look back, I'm like, oh, this pattern. Well, here's the interesting thing. They all lived in there. My grandmother got married very early. And so she left after like two years of being in that apartment. So she wasn't there very long. She had the least exposure and she's doing pretty well, but she had her father died of liver cancer. Her mother died of liver failure and her siblings died of metastatic cancer to the liver. Like there was this pattern. And when I saw that, I was like, wow, this is so profound because of course, my genes come from ancestry. I bet there was some benzene issues with them with this NQ01 as well. And doesn't that make sense? And so interesting that there's a specific exposure to likely benzene in my family. And yeah, absolutely. And it's not even just benzene. It's yeah. so many of the inhaled and the um, aromatic hydrocarbons and some of you know, all the different toxicants. And it's really interesting because you talked about migraines. Well, what is one of the natural treatments for migraines? CoQ10. And so with this, you don't make enough CoQ10, you can't keep it in this active form. Then the other thing is you talked about liver cancer and these breast cancer and all these cancers. Well, one of the things that upregulates NQ01, because if you have one gene that's really not working at all, then you can push the other one a little bit more is sulforaphane. And sulforaphane, there were studies done at Johns Hopkins showing that sulforaphane had breast cancer benefits. And then they've used that same formulation to show that it has liver cancer benefits in China. And so it really all comes together. It's really exciting. And you mentioned the NADPH. Um, when I first got mold toxic back in 2015, I remember being very intolerant to glutathione. And later I realized glutathione reduction um, oxidation involves NADPH. And I was probably so depleted at that point of NADPH. I couldn't tolerate any glutathione. I think it got all reduced or it was just completely gone. And uh, when I started, it was actually several, several years into it that I started doing NAD as a precursor or nicotinamide riboside or several precursors. It was a game changer for me. And I bet, I bet my whole entire life prior to that, I had been really, really deficient on that um, nutrient for NAD pH recycling. And NAD also pushes that NQ01. So those are both things that really help you. So forafane and, yeah. you know, and NAD it makes sense. And so that's the whole point of why we would do genomics, because as a functional medicine physician, you could do trial and error and go, this makes me feel good. This doesn't, 
but isn't it great when someone can come to you and you have this kind of book of them that you can use as a beginning guide to help make those decisions. And that's what Intellix DNA does. Sharon, it's, it's amazing. And I only talk about stuff I totally love and believe in, which is why you're here. Because for me, again, I, I was like, wow, because we know in our head, oh, maybe DIM, maybe calcium D would great, maybe sulforaphane will be helpful for breast cancer. But for me, the sulforaphane has an extra power because of my genetics. So I can very much fine tune. Same with the patients, like who would have known this person had T4 to T3 conversion issues, or this person had intolerance to glucose or whatever we're seeing. So I've been super excited. Um, I'd love for you to share a little bit with us. I think you have some cases that we could jump sure. into that. Sure. We were talking about the fact that this is, uh, this has been a crazy year and anxiety has been a big issue. So I think that a good case to do would be uh, an anxiety case. I think that before I do the anxiety case, what I would love to do, if it's okay with you, is just bring everyone up to date on what a SNP is. Perfect. And so um, if you make it so they can share my screen or do I need to do that? I think uh, you can share and if you just hit screen, share screen. And if that doesn't work, I just hit multiple. Try it out. If it does not go to uh, share. Let me just then, sorry, one second. So no worries. I'm not seeing. At the very bottom under share screen. It went to a black screen. Hmm. Let me see if we can. The other option, if you send me your slides, I can share them for you. But I think it I should be, be much easier if, if you could share for the yeah. sake of. I think I'm gonna oh. do. <laughs> it's, yes, I'm just trying to get it to the back to the in the meantime let's see i'm thinking of a few other things that um oh b12 for me so i have all of the like problems with b12 whether it's um mtrr or again you know some of the names better than i do but basically getting into the cells absorbing it um hypochlorhydria like everything you could uh, i had pernicious anemia all the all the genetics really and i always knew that i did well in b12 but when we started talking about the genetics from my test it was a really aha for me because not only do i do well with b12 i need high doses and that was one of the other things that really was profound for me because I've always done a very high dose and I knew I needed it and I never got toxic, of course. And it was one of those profound ahas when I realized the reason behind that need for B12. And as you mentioned, when we went over the genetics, um, B12, of course, deficiency can relate to cancer as well. So who knew if that would have played into, not only did I have a gut that wasn't absorbing it, but I had genetics that weren't getting into the cells. <laughs> so that was a, a pretty big, um, interesting find when I, when I realized about the B12 as well. So what I'm going to do, Jill, I'm going to share the, this with you, and I'm going to start to talk about genomics sure, while it is being sent to you. Okay. I'm so sorry about that. So mm -hmm. I think that the thing is everybody kind of uses that term genomics and people mm -hmm. are like, well, what does it mean? And I th at what, when we think of genomics, um, we think of, you know, we like know what the gene is, but genomics is a little different than a genetic illness. So genetic illnesses are things like Tay-Sachs, trisomy 21, they tend to be pretty big genetic events, often caused by one gene or a piece of a gene that's what I would call a macroscopic event. Whereas genomics is looking at those single letter changes of DNA. So our DNA is made up of four different letters and A, T, C, and G. And when you, and when you um, change one letter, so you change an A to a G or a C to a T, that tiny little change doesn't usually have a profound effect. And so in fact, sometimes it has no effect at all. But what can happen is sometimes it can completely change the recipe. So there's kind of on off switches in genes. And if that is in what's called the promoter, then it's gonna make that gene be much more of something. If that same effect is something that has a, changes it to stop, it's gonna make you have less of transcription or less of making that protein. So it, I kind of think about it as our genomics is um, recipes. And if you think about, we have recipes for all these different enzymes and proteins, it's kind of like having a recipe for cooking. If you change one word of a recipe from blend to stir, no big deal, but yeah. you change a recipe from bake to broil and it's a big deal. And that's really what we see with genomics. So 
when you get this case, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the case. And, Sharon, and uh, <clears throat> did you email those? I'll just double I did. Check. I did. Okay. Got it. Got so it. I don't know if you um, got it yet. I did uh, not, but I'll keep watching here. Oh, there we go. I think, uh, oh, not, not yet. I'll keep watching. You can start if you want. No. Okay. Well, and I'm wondering. I was, well, I'll tell you about, so I'm going to start with the case. And when you get it, it's slide 21 um, is the case of anxiety. And um, let me make sure. So I sent it to your company. Okay. To the your Dr. Carnahan email. Perfect. Got it. Okay. So um, when the, so this case is a case of a woman who is a nurse, and she has intermittent anxiety, and she's going through menopause right now. She has been an oncology nurse for thirty years. We're going to call her Grace. Any of the cases we're using, of course, we've changed the names. And Grace has um, symptoms of just kind of this anxiety that comes and goes, but particularly she notices that when she's stressed, she is a person who spends a lot of time with a high attention to detail. She's very hardworking, has a family history of some anxiety and OCD type symptoms in her daughter. And she comes to me saying, what can we do about this? Um, and I won't know when you're sharing your screen since my computer is doing something funny, but just let me okay. know. Yeah, and I'm not, <laughs> it's one of those, must be the moon or something. <laughs> All right. I mean, we'll, I'll, I'll make sure it got sent, but otherwise we'll just do it with. You got it. We obviously, we can talk, talk, just talk through it because it's fascinating the way it is. Yeah, uh, and I'm, I'm going to forward okay. it to your other emails as well. Okay, Jill. perfect. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> one of them will have it. Right. Okay. All right. And then you... So, sorry about that. Um, so I just uh, forward it to a couple other of your emails. Got it. So, so anyway, so she has, um, she has a lot of genes. When we look at genomics, we look at hundreds of genes, but we have a particular panel that we call our mental wellness. We particularly did not want to call it mental health because somebody who is dealing with stress or some mild depression symptoms, or even chronic depression or OCD to label that as a disease, as opposed to trying to support them at better understanding themselves doesn't make sense. And so we looked at her genomics and the reason I wanted to share her case is classically, what do we do for anxiety and depression? Uh, benzodiazepines or theanine or drugs or, or Medicaid or even herbals, but we just give them something for it, right? Right. And the most classic prescription medicine is, are like the serotonin medicines, Prozac and Paxil and, yes. and Zoloft to raise serotonin. Well, none of the genes that were in, in Grace's genomics related to serotonin. Mm -hmm. So the first one I want to talk about that she had. And I've got it and we're up. <laughs> so, okay. Oh, yeah. and I can see it now. Yeah, okay, so if, good. If you go to the uh, slide 22. You got it. Okay, perfect. And we start there if you want to put sure. it up there the view, but we can do it just like this. If you don't want the whole screen, whatever way you want it, it's great. The only thing is now for me on Google Drive. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I'll just do it this way. Okay, we're good. <laughs> we get it. We got it. <laughs> so anyway, so she's got a bunch of different genes. And um, if we go to, the, go. you know, so some of the ones she has a neuropeptide S receptor, a diiodinase, an ESR2, none of those have that word serotonin in them because mm -hmm. none of them are serotonergic genes. And um, if you, and you'll see some of them, two copies are in 20%, the estrogen ones in 7%. If you go to the next slide, okay. you'll see that this one gene that she has, the mm -hmm. NPSR1, it is not an anxiety gene as much as it's a wakefulness gene. So ah. Yeah, it's really exciting. Oh, I see the coffee there. I was just going to go there. Is it adenosine related or related to that wakefulness? Of this one is not adenosine, but uh, there is interestingly there's an adenosine receptor gene that's related to multiple chemical sensitivity. Just which oh. is a total separate aside. This one is related to orexin, and you and I, of course, know orexin <laughs> as that pathway that was discovered after we graduated medical school. And we're like, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> it's a new hormone that was discovered only about 10, 15 years ago. And it's a wakefulness hormone. So it's kind of the opposite of GABA, which makes you sleepy. 
And there's a whole new class of medicines that lower orexin that help people sleep. But this pathway makes you have higher orexin and higher histamine. Uh, and again, think about antihistamines. They mm -hmm. make people sleepy. And having a little bit of histamine can be good for focus, makes you awake. Having a little orexin is good. But this, when you have two copies of this, you have 10 times as much. Wow. So that makes you, if you're that awake, you feel anxious. Wow. And so the thing about it, the symptoms of it, and this was totally grace when she got stressed, she said her family, her friends, her employer could all tell because in, in front of scrubs, she would get kind of red and flushed and people would think she was embarrassed and it would just happen without controlling when she got stressed. And that's that histamine. So once we knew what was going on, we could talk about, well, you can take pycnogenol, you can take quercetin, you can take bromelain, you could take regular antihistamines, and those will help that reaction. But we also could tell her about things that could kind of help turn off that wakefulness pathway because she didn't sleep well when she got stressed. And so whether she wanted to use luteolin or melatonin or Belsamra, which is a prescription, yeah. at least now she had an understanding and options. Oh, this is great. And I'm wondering, is that would that be a common... Uh, well, there's other histamine pathways, right? So there could be other reasons why someone would flush on their chest because I can hear our, our listeners going, well, I flushed like that. Do I have this gene? And I'm guessing that this is one of the genes that can cause that, but there's probably others too, right? Absolutely. There's a whole bunch of different histamine pathways because there's histamine that affects mm -hmm. the brain and histamine that affects the gut and histamine that affects allergies. But so yeah, there's a lot of reasons for all of these things. That's actually why I think that in spite of the direct-to-consumer genomics movement, I think it's really great if you can have a physician as a guide. And that's why Intellix DNA is really a collaboration. It's something that a physician orders and helps a patient interpret. Yeah, I'm glad you clarified that because that was one of the questions at the beginning. I want to make sure as we're talking, because there's a lot of consumers listening, which is great. I, I love to inform the consumers and you can ask your doctor to order this. And we'll talk at the end of how you can do that. But I wanted to say, this is actually, I, I am all for getting labs to patients. And nowadays it's very common, but this kind of complexity and especially sometimes the people get really afraid of having this data and not knowing what to do about it. So I think in this case, it's incredibly important that you work with your doctor on the data because it, the pathways are complex. And, uh, and I know some of my patients, I have great respect because they know as much as I do about certain pathways, but then I can help be the quarterback and kind of guide them on the journey. And it's, it's actually a whole different category. And so it's considered a clinical decision support tool. And because there's so much information in our genomics report, we can legally only release it to licensed healthcare wow. professionals. So MDs, DOs, wow. naturopaths, they're licensed, nurse practitioners, PAs, et cetera. Wonderful. Ready to, you just kind of tell me when to go on. <laughs> yeah, this is great. So Grace also had this rare type of estrogen receptor. And the reason I say rare type is there's two parts of estrogen receptors and kind of we classically think of high estrogen states or estrogen receptors as being related to endometriosis and fibroids and breast tenderness and all those kind of high estrogen things. But there's another kind of estrogen receptor called ESR2. And ESR2's job is to turn off ESR1 to keep it from getting overactive. And in the absence of any estrogen, you get more inflammation and you need even more ESR2 to kind of calm things down. So postmenopausally, ESR2 is involved in cognition. It's involved in you know, men perimenopause type symptoms, including anxiety. And she had a, a variant that's only in 7%, and you can switch the slide, that is associated with less ESR2 activity. So then you go, well, what can we do about that? Because that makes her have more than double the risk of anxiety postmenopausally. Let's go ahead and switch. <laughs> there we go. And so things that you can do is you can use, you don't really want to use estrogen per se, because that's going to give a kind of a balanced ESR1, ESR2. You want to use either genistein or a rhubarb extract, because that's going to bind 20 times more tightly to ESR2 than ESR1. And that's going to really help her. In fact, you have to be a little careful with hormone replacement in somebody who has this, because progesterone can sometimes make anxiety symptoms worse with this SNP. And estrogen, you're going to increase kind of balance that ESR1 and 2. Very nice. Yes. And then Grace is uh, also, this is- I remember this one. Yeah, <laughs> this is we were talking about in your other patient, one of the DIO2 SNPs 
which makes it that you don't convert T4 to T3, particularly in the brain. So that was a really easy switch. You switch someone from a little bit of Synthroid to a little bit of Lyothyronine or Cytomel. And in fact, her daughter has hypothyroidism and we before, and now we have her daughter's genomics, but before we had her daughter's genomics, we're like, wait, her daughter has anxiety too. Let's switch her daughter at the same time. So that was an easy fix. And again, you don't think of thyroid as being part of anxiety. No, or hypo, wow. Yeah, and it's really amazing because it's 1.5 times the risk of anxiety just when you can't make enough T3 in the brain and 1.5 times the risk of depression as well. So that was important. That's a, almost a 50% increased risk. And so again, the reason I'd want to share this pathway with you or this patient is had I not had this, I would have been talking to her about things that would increase serotonin. And that is at the top of the anxiety panel, some SNPs that affect serotonin, but it wasn't the answer for her. And so that is why it was so helpful. I love it. And I just want to comment again, as a clinician, I would think, okay, anxiety, is it GABA? Is it serotonin? Is it um, you know, too much stimulants? Is it too much stress? And none of these things would have been on the top of my radar, estrogen SNP, T3, T4, yeah. SNP, you know, so this is so, so relevant because, and I'm sure if there's clinicians listening, they can understand that too, how helpful this is to have the details. Do you want to do another case about cognition? Yes, let's do. Okay. And is Go it next. okay? You right after this one. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We have an ADHD one as well, but I think that today too will probably be plenty. And this is, I chose this case because I know that a lot of the people that you work with are younger and people often are embarrassed when they start to have word finding problems in their forties, but it's common. A lot of people have word finding or memory issues in the forties, and it can be because of detox pathways that you can't transport mercury or different toxins out of your brain. It can be because of issues with different nutrients. There's so, so many pathways um, it can be with that. You don't make enough choline. I mean, it goes on and on with nutritional pathways, but this was a 52 year old engineer where it became significant enough that she was thinking she might have to switch careers. Wow. She, uh, yeah. It, it was a big deal for her because she said it's problematic at work because if you're having problems with your math and you're an engineer, that yeah. that's really hard. She did have a family history of Alzheimer's, but she said her mom didn't get symptoms till she was 70. And that her father also has some memory issues, but he died of heart disease. And so she was really surprised to see this coming on so early and really terrified. And so if we go to the next slide, um, just again, to remind the people who are listening about APOE4, APOE4 is that gene that we label often as the Alzheimer's gene. And the reason it gets labeled that way is because 65% of people who have Alzheimer's do have at least one APOE4 uh, gene variant. It can range from 40 to 80%, depending on the population. And each copy can convey, depends on kind of what it's combined with, about two or three-fold risk, um, sometimes four-fold risk. If you have two copies, it can be a 13 times fold risk. And so this is a big deal. Mm -hmm. And what we'll what you'll see is that Sandy did have this. But she only has one copy. And so that doesn't usually cause problems until the age of 65. It's called late onset Alzheimer's. So then we had to go, well, what else is going on? And that's where having a robust kind of genomics tool with hundreds of pathways that have been studied really helps. And there's a whole bunch of other pathways we looked at, genes that are right next to APOE4 that have an additive effect, kind of like a light switch, mitochondrial pathways, pathways that help to break down acetylcholine, inflammation factors, detox. We can kind of go on and on. But for Sandy, one of the biggest factors, okay, so we used lots and lots of things, hundreds of them. <laughs> for Sandy, two of the most important SNPs related to her inflammation pathways. And I always say that anytime you see the letter alpha in medicine, you know, think about the alpha male dog. Mm -hmm. So alpha is kind of like that really important so TNF-alpha and IL-1-alpha refer to some important cytokines. And before the year 2020, a lot of people who weren't in medicine would have no idea what a cytokine is. Yeah. But thanks to COVID, I think we've all kind of heard of cytokines. And cytokines are these little chemicals that get released and cause an inflammatory mess, sometimes a storm of inflammation. The alpha ones, both TNF-alpha and IL-1-alpha are really important because they can cross the blood-brain barrier. Wow. So they're more important for cognition 
and Alzheimer's risk than some of the other interleukins. Yeah. And this particular SNP um, that she had is only is in 18% of the population, but it's on a complete this TNF alpha and the IL-1 alpha is only on 9%, but it's the issue with it, it's combined with APOE4 mm -hmm. and that's a completely different gene. And so one of the things that we know, if you go to the next slide, is that TNF alpha can be more problematic in people with APOE4. And that's because APOE4 individuals already have a problem with brain inflammation. For those of you who don't really know as much as you want about APOE4, the reason APOE4 is such a big deal is it's not a gene that makes codes just for one protein. It's a gene that binds, the, the, the product of the gene binds to 1,700 different genes throughout the genome and helps to turn them on. So it creates its own kind of storm in the brain and in the body that makes you have lots of problems. And that, so the issue with it, when you have TNF alpha and APOE4 together is you get more inflammation, but one study showed you can have an up to six fold increased risk of Alzheimer's because this inflammation storm and elevated TNF alpha makes it so you can't clear your amyloid well, that kind of gunks up the nerves, it causes neuronal cell death, and that leads to dementia. So we knew we had to address TNF alpha. The question- talk about the garbage collector because that's really how it is, right? Like it's cleaning up the waste. And we do that when we, I love talking about sleep. So I'm just gonna insert that here because this a lot of times happens when we're sleeping in our deep sleep. Some of the brain is, is restoring, cleaning up toxins. And also one of the important reasons why sleep is so important with you know anyone dealing with cognitive issues. Absolutely. And yeah, we didn't really talk. I didn't talk too much about that. So I'm glad you brought it up, Jill. But yes, we need those garbage collectors. You don't want too much inflammation in them though, because then you get scarring. Right. So all of you guys have watched TV. Well, most of you people watching have probably watched TV and heard those late night commercials or regular commercials. Ask your doctor about da 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 when they're talking about psoriasis or you know Crohn's disease or any of these illnesses that are autoimmune. And so TNF alpha is also a really important autoimmune pathway. And so we have these drugs for autoimmune disease, but the problem with them is they're all injectable biologics, really big molecules that don't cross the brain. And they in fact have studied those biologics and TNF alpha inhibitors in Alzheimer's by injecting them into the spine and they can get rapid improvement in cognition. Wow. I know the only problem is it's not feasible to get a spine injection every week. Right. <laughs> of a $4,000 medication. <laughs> right. So it was more of a proof of concept. So then you go, well, what can we do to lower TNF alpha naturally? Also, you know, Sandy's not that bad. She's got mild cognitive impairment. She was have her score on that one to 30 was around a 24. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't bad enough that we would even do that. Um, well, it turns out there's some natural products and my favorite of it is lion's mane mushroom. Mm -hmm that are really, really good at inhibiting TNF alpha. Um, there's, a, there's a new Amazon movie uh, about called Fantastic Fungi that talks yeah. a little bit. I just heard friends say you must watch this. It's on my list. <laughs> yes, I think all of us in the natural world, it's a, it's a worthwhile $4 investment. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's one of my favorite things to lower TNF alpha and one of the ones we used for Sandy, but because she was really in a crisis, we used a lot of these things. We used sulforaphane because it also helps with nerve repair and helps with detox. Um, we used curcumin because it also is really good at inflammation. We had her drink more green tea. And many of these have human memory trials. Mm. Okay. And the good oh, thing yeah. is the same things lower interleukin one alpha. So I didn't have to come up with a whole complete different list for her other inflammatory pathways. That's why I loved what COVID taught, at least for me, any of us in this world, it's kind of like no duh, right? <laughs> because yes, there's been like with LPS endotoxemia, the same cytokines have been, you know, causing damage to the body and they underline all kinds of heart disease and cardiovascular disease and uh, diabetes and obesity and mood disorders. And of course, COVID mimic that too, but only because it produced the same cytokine storm. Like this is actually common to a lot of different illnesses, whether it's brain dysfunction or post COVID long haulers. We'll have to get on a separate call just to talk about all that inflammation, Jill, because yes. there's really fascinating genomics regarding NLRP3 uh, and the inflammasomes and interacting with the. With when the I'm guessing it's almost like those ones that get turned on and not stop, like the people who genetically get turned on the cytokines get turned on and they don't stop. It's same with mold in a way, because 
those of us who have had mold related illness, not only do our cytokines get turned on, it's this inflammatory pathway that perpetuates itself. And we also aren't very good at tagging the toxins to get rid of them. In general, those are some of the underlying issues. Absolutely. So some people it's, they turn on inflammation and can't stop it. And that's one pathway. And then your patient that had kind of neuro Lyme that we talked yeah. about, he couldn't make nerf two to turn it, to turn on the anti-inflammatory. So it's yeah. either that you can't turn on the anti-inflammatory or you over turn on the inflammatory. There's, there's lots of really interesting, uh, interesting genomics, but Sandy also had, so she had her own inflammation but we all know that mitochondrial pathways are super important for neurodegenerative diseases, whether it's Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, um, you know, MS, any of these things. And she had this mitochondrial pathway that's found in about 11% of the population, but it's not the typical mitochondrial pathway that responds to fasting and you know, CoQ10 and carnitine and alpha lipoic acid. It's a mitochondrial pathway for synthesizing purines, which is basically a way of saying, for, ba- for the mitochondria to be able to make its own DNA. Well, yeah. if the mitochondria can't make its own DNA, you're going to have problems with their functioning because they can't kind of stay alive. And uh, this particular this particular SNP is addressed with folinic acid, making sure you have enough B12, enough choline, things that wouldn't be my go-to with someone mm-hmm. who had cognitive decline. So that was really helpful. And then when we looked at um, her nutrigenomics and anytime we're doing anything in functional medicine, we always look at gut. We always look at detox. We always look at nutrition, but this allows us with genomics to look at it in much more detailed. And it turns out she had genes in the choline synthesis pathway. Choline is estrogen dependent, um, in terms of how we make it. Um, one of the genes involved is called PEMT. Well, yep. what age is she? She's getting perimenopausal. So we need to support her choline synthesis because she's losing her estrogen. B6 is needed for brain to work. And so all of these things we were able to address, B6, B12, lion's mane, uh, mitochondrial vitamin support. And then within three months, her cognitive scores and cognitive skills were back where she was like, okay, I don't have to retire at 52, which was problematic for many reasons. Amazing. And again, what I love is there are some, we've talk, we've been in the Dale Bredesen groups and talked about these cases. And what's difficult is there's some that are moderate to severe cognitive decline. And sometimes there's not a lot, no matter how much genetics, you know, when there's a certain amount of dysfunction past a certain level, just like if your pancreas has autoimmune type one diabetes and it fails and you've had so much damage, no matter what you do, you can't reverse it. Same with the brain. But in these cases, these are very exciting to me and to you as well, because these early cases and these younger people that have it often, if there's pieces of the puzzle that we find out, like in this case, we can actually really reverse the cognitive impairment. And I think what we're learning with the work of Dr. Bredesen and combining that with genomics, what we're seeing in um, both the study that um, Dr. Bredesen has been using our genomics at and in our own work at Resilient Health is the threshold for reversal is actually um, in the dementia range. I mean, we are having not all the time, but we've had good success with people that are in the early dementia as well. So, but I agree, the earlier you can catch it, the easier it is. If you have someone who, so that scoring goes from zero to 30, 19 is kind of mild dementia, 20, 21. If we can catch them, even when they're in the mild dementia range, we can get them back to being highly functional, even sometimes have back to normal. So again, the, the reason we would choose genomics is to, allow for personalized medicine and be able to look at the root, the root cause. And then if you want to go for how people can yeah. get intelligence. <laughs> I was uh, wondering, I'm like, what? I see the questions coming in. Yeah. Like, what are we yeah. the, the biggest thing is it's a spit kit. It's really easy. Mm-hmm. Um, go to the next slide. And it's yeah. only ordered through clinicians. Then a clinician, this is Dr. Pichardo in our office. Sorry, did I go too quickly? <laughs> no, that's fine. And then going to the next slide. If you want to learn more, we're happy to give you a list of physicians Perfect. that um, and uh, providers that are trained on IntelliX DNA. There is on our website a sheet that you can download and take to your physician if you have an integrative or functional medicine physician that you're working with that then tells them how to contact us and get trained. We now have online training, which makes it a lot easier that we used to have live conferences, which were really fun, but we now have both options and um, they can also learn more just from the website. Awesome. I will be sure and put that in the chat. And uh, 
I'm sure you guys are all like excited. It's the worst thing is you give this awesome solution like, oh, where do I get it? And but you can go there, you can get, find a physician or like Sharon said, you can actually ask your physician to order this. And um, it was actually through another doc who had ordered it through my first for my first patient. Now I knew about it, but and I will just say as a clinician, I felt overwhelmed. I was like, oh no, another test. But this is so powerful. I am totally going to be ordering this on many of my patients, at least those ones who um, who want it. Uh, and I think it's super powerful. Sharon, that's su such great information. I love the anxiety and how it was stuff that we would have never suspected. And then the cognitive decline and how many people don't have some sort of brain fog. And what would I find there too, even in 30 and 40 and young people, there's often these little snips or things that relate to um, transport of a nutrient into the brain or a detox pathway, right? Yeah. 20% of the population, almost like 18, 19%, they can have plenty of B12 circulating in their blood, but they can't get it into their brain. So right. something as simple as B12 can make a difference. And for, for clinicians that are watching that are worried about, gosh, I don't know if I want to learn this because it's going to be difficult. We've actually added what I call the key points, but it's really the, it, it's really the cliff notes of genomics that kind of give you the easy um, answer as to how the gene works and the potential interventions but we also walk our cl new clinicians through their first three reports because it is eventually like riding a bike, but it's a yeah. lot to just change your, you know, to change your paradigm of how you practice medicine. And like you said, it's, it's been a lot of physicians have said that it's been game changing because they can get so much farther in one consult. And so um, just know that if you are a clinician that we help you and, uh, in fact, it's a, we have a support group of fellow clinicians as well that you can also ask of people who are using it. Yeah, so. I felt very supported. Cause again, I'm just, I was like, oh, I don't know if I wanna get into another test or but it's been great Sharon, just nothing but good. I am so grateful of your journey and the fact that it led you here. And um, I can't say enough good about what you're doing in the world, your brilliance. I love when we get to talk about tests and thank you for being you. Thank you for bringing this and just been a delight to talk to you. I think we're gonna have to have part two though. <laughs> So. I would love to do part two, Jill. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. And the conversations we've had about patients have been so exciting because that's why I love doing the physician walkthroughs is I'm like, wow, I now have hundreds of extra cases that I've heard. And I often get to hear the successes um, in follow-up. And it's just so much fun. You know, both of us, we're, we're women who've been around for a couple of decades. We don't have to say how many. Yep. <laughs> and I think that we do most of us in functional medicine we do what we do because we want to make a difference. And I know that both my co-founder and I, that was why we did this. It, we were like, we can do this and we're actually doing work with autism. So if any of your listeners want to hear about that work, it is right now, we only have seven users in the United States because the pilot was done in Australia with the Australian Center for Genomic Analysis, but we're going to be training a lot more doctors in that in September. So they can reach out to us if they're interested in that work as well. And the work is doing really, um, it's great. It's going quite well. Fantastic. Well, thank you again, Sharon. So nice to have you today. Thanks. Great to see you, Jill.